you have essentially a problem shooting, so your rifle shoots one and a half or two or two and a half or three MOA, um, you, you, you should be checking that. If you're actually checking the group, you should be checking it at 100 yards. Um, and the reason for that is to start off with, at 100 yards, your, your muzzle velocities, your extreme spread on your muzzle velocity, so your speed of your bullet, um, is not a huge issue. It can be a little bit different and it's not going to make a lot of difference to how it actually hits down the hits at the 100 yards because there's not a lot of drop in the bullet. What you're going to see at 100 yards is your, your general spread all over the place. So your group will enlarge but it'll tend to be all over the place. You may see some clues. You may find that it's very flat and it shoots side to side. That'll tell you something about how the gun's shooting. You may find it's very narrow but the, the, the actual group is, is stringing it straight up and down that'll tell you something about the rifle and this is the point that I want to go through and try and explain to people essentially a rifle I have here my, my 243 um, and actually shooting the rifle in the way of getting a small group is not just as I think some people feel it is if you point the rifle dead straight pull the trigger the bullet should go to that place it isn't actually how a rifle works um, it may seem to work that way and a smaller rifle, a smaller calibre rifle will tend to be more like that um, and some even larger calibres will be like that, it will be a simple case of point and shoot. That's really more by chance. So basically you have to have your rifle set up. Um, and your rifle and your load basically set up. Now what that means is in, in the very basics of it is that your the, the um, weight of the projectile you're shooting has to be matched to your the twist of your rifle. So essentially you'll find on all weights of projectiles there will be a minimum twist for the barrel. So this rifle here is the is a Hauer 243. It has a 1 in 10 twist barrel um, and I can shoot a maximum of a 100 grain, 100 grain bullet out of it. If I try and shoot a 107 grain bullet out of it, which doesn't seem much different, the bullet won't stabilise, and then I won't get a good grip out of it. Um, and I can't get any distance out of it because the bullet won't stabilise. It needs to spin faster. At a 95 grain down to a 45 grain, this barrel works nicely and stabilises the bullet quite well. That's one very small ingredient, but you need to have that ingredient right. The, the next things, essentially, or what I should explain, is that when you pull the trigger, the bullet doesn't instantly end up at the other end of the barrel. It has to accelerate from zero speed, from sitting dead still, it has to accelerate up to whatever you end up as a muzzle velocity. So this one here runs around the 2900 feet per second. So that, when it goes bang, it does not instantly go to 2900 feet per second. When it goes bang, it goes from zero and accelerates up to the end of the barrel and essentially once it leaves the barrel, it essentially stops accelerating. We can talk about if there's a little bit of inertia and it carries on accelerating for a little bit. In the basics of it, it stops accelerating and starts decelerating once the pressure stops pushing it. Um, for that reason, there is the first and, and different barrels, different barrel length, different speed bullets have a different amount of time that they are going to take to get out of the barrel. Um, but essentially there is milliseconds whether that's 10 milliseconds or that's or that's 15 milliseconds or however many, there is time of when that bullet is coming out of the barrel. Because of that, all the dynamics of the gun come into play. So that means we all know that we want to free float our barrel. The reason we want to free float the barrel is because of exactly because of that. When it is accelerating at that barrel, there's an explosion that's happened back in here. So the whole barrel goes through a shock. A shock travels instantly from one end of the barrel to the other. There's, 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 there's also a wave of shock lines that are coming up and down, and I can get very complicated in explaining that. But the simple understanding is that if your barrel is naturally sitting where it's essentially from the end of the chamber here, that barrel is then free, it's going to react in a very similar, same sort of pulse as it goes out the barrel and you can obviously have a lighter barrel, you can have heavy barrels, there's all sorts of fluted, all sorts of stuff that are sexually going to affect it. Doesn't really matter what it does, what does matter is that it happens consistently. Consistently. Obviously a heavier barrel is where you find target barrels and that's to try and control some of that, that's also to change how they behave to heat and, and, and once again I don't want to get too complicated but what we want is consistency. 
So that's the reason for free floating that barrel, making sure it's not rubbing on something to make it in act in peculiar over a piece that it's actually rubbing on to make it inconsistent. The next bit of this, that's just the barrel. Of course, what's also happening is the whole action. You being attached to the back here with your hand and, and with your shoulder onto it, to how your trigger, what your trigger's actually doing, what your finger's doing, all that stuff is reacting as the gun goes bang. Um, you'll also find um, that essentially the chassis of the gun or the stock of the gun is a very important piece of what's actually happening. When it actually goes bang, that pressure has to come back and push at this part of the gun. And if you've got a very flexible stock that has a real angle to it, you may find that that is actually causing a little flex that can change how the actual barrel was moving in that instance. Um, what essentially once again I'll say is if it's always 100% consistent then the bullet's always going to get to the same place. You'll sight to the same place and it'll always go there. One of the tricks is the more that movement is in the gun and the more that you are affecting the gun with, your, with how you're pressing up to the gun here is that essentially the more consistent you have to be. The less that is causing a change in the gun, so the more rigid chassis rifles and things that have essentially um, well, I won't go there instantly. Essentially, the less movement that's actually happening, the less it's going to be affected by the consistency of things. So you can. There's also things like a, a bipod, the Harris bipod. Nice, simple, easy to use bipod. Um, but you'll notice that in this short position, it really doesn't have a lot of movement. So it's more inclined to when it gets pushed backwards to do a little depending on the ground, whether it jumps and skips or it moves or it wobbles. I'll show you in, a, in another form when you take this up to where these legs are extended. Then you see how all of a sudden you've got so much more movement. So by having that little bit of free play in there, you'll see that essentially you have it preloaded forward. When it goes back, it can do this amount of movement in a form that is then fairly fluid, it's not jumping, the legs aren't moving. So it's one of the things that I like if I'm using a Harris bipod, I like to be able to use it with some length. Doesn't mean you mean you have to have your gun high up in the air, it means choose your bipod to suit. And it means that in a in very short, in the 6x9 style bipod, when it's down nice and low, that's all seems to be nice for people, but you do have this as an issue. And obviously it depends on the dirt you're on and that side of things. We have exactly the same thing happening for the rear monopods that happen down the back of the rifle, where essentially that same thing, if you have a leg down the back here, it's sitting on it, makes it nice and still to pull the trigger on it. Because it holds nice and still, you can hold that crosshair on nice and neatly. But what can actually happen is that when it's pushing backwards and it's sitting on that simple, that simple um, single peg or single post at the back there, you can end up with a little bounce as it bounces across because it's sitting on something where it can't just move nicely. Ideally you want this nice smooth action, I'll put that back up to where that's doing it. Ideally you want a nice smooth action straight forward and back as it goes back. The same as if it's sitting on the slides of a bag um, and, and there's various ways of doing it. I will say and I'll, say, and I'll keep saying it doesn't matter, all these things are not absolute things. If the gun cycles nicely, if the gun shoots very accurately, don't need to mess with it. But if the gun doesn't, if the gun's got a problem, these are some of the places you start looking. Another thing that I've noticed, and I started to talk about the stock down the back here. Essentially, where you're pressing against the stock, essentially where, what position that is. I like having stocks with an adjustable height and where I press against it, where that weight, that main weight of what sits against your collarbone or against your shoulder, wherever you're loading up, you want to have as close to the dead straight line of the actual stock so it pushes straight through. This is a lower calibre, this is only a 243, so I have this a little lower. Doesn't need to be so high, it works quite nicely there. If I, if I set this up, this same chassis in a 3-3 Lapur, you'll probably find I have this spaced up a little bit higher so that I have that dead straight behind the bolt so that the gun pulls back, it pushes back as straight as possible. So that essentially when it pushes back, if, if essentially you're pushing here, 
you see that load is above here, when it goes bang, it's going to raise up. It's just going to raise up because essentially that centre of gravity is pushing above it. Same would happen for if I have my shoulder pushing up high, up higher than everything, and it goes bang, you'll tend to find the gun will squat down at the front here, simply because it's got that, that weight happening on it. And even if all your frame and everything is nice and solid, keep in mind that the, the whole chassis weight of things is going to end up loading things because of where you're putting that leverage. And I'd say all these features are very relevant to your weight versus your calibre. If this gun weighed 200 pounds um, and it's the 300 win mag, it's probably hardly going to move. It's a very heavy gun. It's probably going to behave fairly naturally. As long as you've got a free floated barrel, all that weight there is going to hold it still. If this is a 300 win mag and it weighed 10 pounds, you'll probably find it's more likely to bounce around. So the likes of carbon barrels, the likes of all the things to make them nice and light to hunt with can be the same thing that cause you more issues when you're trying to shoot. Um, I find the likes of the, a lot of people, the only place they can go and shoot things is in a bench rest situation. Now, keep in mind that you can obviously shoot very accurately in a bench rest form, but there's some other features going on which you don't have quite the control. You tend to be shooting on like this a hard bench surface rather than the dirt that you can dig into. You tend to be shooting where essentially, whereas in a prone position, you can essentially get your whole body down behind it and shoot where the, the weight comes through your collarbone and you can push it down your whole body to your hips. When you're sitting on a chair to the side, you're sitting behind one shoulder. So you're shooting on one shoulder. So you tend to get a reaction that although ideally should be straight forward and backwards, it's just as likely to be twisting you around or twisting you up or twisting you down because essentially you haven't got the same push behind it. In a lot of those situations you can't use a muzzle, muzzle brake so you have to do it all with your shoulder. So then the weight of the gun can really help you in that situation. The same thing I would say in the way of where you can use muzzle brakes. Muzzle brakes aren't all just a muzzle brake. The way they make things behave um, and the way that that actually comes in and affects things. You can have the, the ports on the top of the, of the, of the muzzle brake to help with muzzle ride. Um, that can actually be a negative because you'll actually find in some cases it'll go too far. And obviously when you have this that can make the rifle, um, the, a muzzle brake to make muzzle rise better or worse, and you also have your shoulder point that can make that muzzle rise better or worse, the combination of the two become very relevant. And that all factors back into the weight of the gun and the stiffness of the chassis and the bipod, all those bits and pieces. The other feature of um, setting up a rifle which is very relevant is actually your scope position or your eye relief on your scope. Now people probably know how to set that up, but that's talking about essentially where you put your scope on, leave it loose sit down, lay down or sit down behind the rifle, shoulder up to the rifle and then move it backwards and forwards until you get your eye picture right. I've generally found I've shot the rifle a few times until I've really found that because it's actually about you've got to work out exactly how you're shouldering up, where, how much, what pressure you want to put on your rifle which actually that changes. You can have your rifle very gently pressed, pressed I should say and your eye may be sitting about here you push harder, or you're pushing out harder, putting more pressure on, you'll find your eye moves forward a little bit. And what I tended to find happens, happens with me, happens with everyone I've seen, is that you tend to adjust to how your scope is set up to shoot the rifle. And that may not be right. If you find that, in actual fact, when you push yourself further forward, or you either have to overextend, the way you've got it set up, the way it's all shooting now, you actually find that you're overextending and pushing further in there, pulling your shoulder back and getting it more in there so you can get your eye on the rifle is what you need to do, then that's in the wrong position. And the same as if you find that when you do go all the way forward, you haven't got good a good sight picture, you end up pushing it back a little bit and pushing, pulling your head back a little bit, you're changing that pressure. So it's one of the things to get that, to get your scope position right for not only your natural shooting position, which you'd think is only one thing, I've tended to find it changes a little bit. You actually find that the how you're shouldering up to that rifle, how you want to do that, 
has to be how that rifle shoots well. And then your eye, then your eye relief is what you adjust it to. So it's something I tend to leave as a as an open option. I tend to move that around a little bit to do with the particular rifle and how I'm shooting it. So listen, that's it's all essentially trying to say that um, essentially we're talking about bits and pieces that are very relevant for trying to to diagnose why your gun is shooting. Um, more or less accurately. So when you're looking for a problem with your shooting, one of the things I like to do, and if you haven't got mates that can tell you, take a video of your gun, see how it shoots. I certainly use our videos, I look at our videos, I, I video the gun to see how it shoots. So I can see, ideally, I want every gun. Not everyone does, um, and and it's certainly about my shooting position and it's about how I set up behind the gun, but I like to see that gun essentially go straight back. So there's just a, there is really truly, I don't know if I can duplicate it, but there's really truly when it, when it, when it fires, it goes bang, straight backwards and forwards. Straight backwards and forwards. You know, so in this situation I'm not set up, I haven't got the loaded up or that sort of things, but the moment I see the gun do this, where it jumps up and back down, or I see it squat down, or I see the, the way the gun actually behaves, which is also a case, the way the the idiot behind the gun, the way I am actually positioned behind the gun, the way I move, the way my body reacts, the way things are happening, what's actually going on with it is very important. One of the clues I use for myself when I'm actually shooting with a rifle is that when I'm actually loaded up behind that and I can see um, after I've taken my shot is where the gun, where the rifle is still pointing. The likes of the muzzle brake and that side of things, a lot of people use for the fact that they can watch their bullet trace. It's a great thing to do. I find that with all my rifles the way they're set up, I want to be able to do that. The truth of it is an extreme long range shooting. We don't use a bullet trace, but I actually use it as one of the clues as to how my gun's shooting. So essentially if I pull the trigger and when, that, when all the dust is settled and I'm still looking at the target, if I'm more than five MOA away from where, where my hold was, if it's more than five, it's not doing something. I'm doing something wrong or the gun's doing something wrong. I really want it to be one or two, ideally one MOA. I pull the trigger or nothing. I pull the trigger and then when I've everything settled, I'm looking at it, that crosshair is still on that target. That tells me everything's working really well. Very unlikely to be able to pull to be able to um, get right back on zero if the gun's done a lot of moving. If it's done a lot of moving, it's going to move somewhere. And I would also tell you, if it is moving somewhere, every time you pull the trigger, it's bounded off 10 MOA, so 10 targets white, you're, you're over to the right, breaks them out, it tells you your gun is jumping to that place. The way your shoulder's setting up to it, the way it's actually responding is going over to that place. There's other details that I can go through in the in all the normal things, which I've got other videos that'll go through actually how you're pulling your trigger. But one of the things I'll say about a larger calibre in a gun that isn't responding well is that, listen, we're all humans and what'll happen is you'll start to react badly to it. So then your trigger pull, which should obviously be a nice squeeze that pulls straight through the stock. It simply pulls. You should be able to do that in a dry fire situation and nothing flinched, nothing moved. Um, that can, even if you're doing that, that can change when the gun's given you a smack. When it's punching backwards and then you'll start to find to get that smooth break. You should be able to, in your, in your mind's eye, you should have been able to know exactly when that trigger, that, that trigger broke, exactly where your target was sitting. So exactly where your crosshairs were sitting on the target, I should say. Um, but certainly how you respond and simply how you pull that trigger. You start yanking the trigger because the thing's got you nervous. That'll change how you shoot. But listen, I'll, um, I, I think that sort of, I'm trying to make some sense of that. What I'm, what I'm coming back to is that the fine tuning of a load um, is, although um, relevant, it's not as relevant for fixing big problems in the way of shooting. Um, and the, the simple truth of it is I don't use any labour testing. I get a good bullet. So I tend to run a burger, but a, a Sierra Match King, a, a, a Barnes, or whatever, you get a good, a good, good projectile uh, that's matched properly to the spin of your bar of your rifle, or the twist of your of your barrel, and then go through and set it up 
What I try and run is a decent pressure. I go up to almost full pressure. I want to make sure that I can still see it's not totally flattening out the primers. Um, it's not jamming or anything when, when, when it unloads and it reloads. It feels nice on that side of things. All very important for telling me how it is. And I tend to find a pressure that I've got a little bit of room to move. Um, pressure is relevant to temperature, so you'll find I find some of the loads that I set up in the winter time will start to get a little bit tight or a little bit square on the primers when I'm running in hotter conditions. And then I've ten, I've found that I essentially back off my load, so my data is about a load that fits all the conditions I shoot in. Um, and then th that little bit of extra speed, yes, it'd be nice. Is it worth it? Ah, listen, I set up a scope where I've got good elevation and then I can run 120 minutes of elevation or some holdover and really that does it for most of the loads that I shoot. So listen, I hope that helps. I hope that makes some sense. Um, I'm coming back to the fine tuning of a load, the exact tuning of a load. Yes, there are some benefits, but they're benefits that in my mind take you from half MOA down to quarter MOA. If you are not at half MOA, you've got work to do on your gun. You've got work to do on you, and you've got work to do on your gun. Make that combination work. So like I said, hope that helps, and, um, and um, we'll catch you next time.